one in terms of business and economics and of course issues to do with policy but first of all before we get into the you know the, the, the big things that we want to talk about i want us to finish up on this story of imf gishinga i'm going to ask you this one so kenya's debt stock to imf is at about 180.7 billion kenya shillings and of course it is now emerging that we are struggling to pay that money are we at tipping point ken Well, it has been a source of concern, the levels of debt that this country carries, are not least because of the manner in which it crowds out the private sector. Um, I think in the new formation is they want to calculate debt as a percentage of GDP, and they're proposing it at a 55% of debt to GDP, uh, looking at net present value. That's still on the higher side. Uh, the IMF used to have recommendations that developing countries should not go beyond 40% debt to GDP. So we hope that they will be able to revise it uh, further downwards. Very well. And I want us to rest the issue of debt there. Um, we have handled debt quite enough times in this show and of course the subsequent shows even on the prime time bulletin. I want us to talk about something that has been making headlines, particularly this week. That is with regard to the COVID-19 vaccine certification. I'm going to go with William first. William, all the service providers were asked to comply and they were asked to send away people who do not have the COVID-19 certificate, uh, particularly uh, the vaccination certificate. Now, the other question that is now coming up is the way to ascertain legitimate certificates. Talk to us about that, William. <clears throat> well, thank you. The, uh, the government has a from we seem to be having a problem with his connection right there. Well, Hora, I'd like you to jump into that conversation, really. I mean, with the existence of River Road and people want services in this country, we're already seeing some stores, uh, you know, sending away people who do not have the certificates. How do we ensure that we are dealing with legitimate certificates, Wohoro? Uh, I, I think that's very much an administ administrative uh, um, administrative detail. I have nothing. I'm very well equipped to comment on. Given that uh, to date the the Ministry of Health has been very uh, effective mm. in uh, getting the technology working for them. So my question actually is more more on the basics of you know enforceability among others. Enforceability in the fact that that's also a death sentence to a lot of businesses. So sometimes I wonder that some of these measures, while they seem to be for public health, actually have an even bigger public health impact in terms of how it affects uh, the, the health of, of, of uh, Kenyans in terms of just loss of jobs. I like how you put it, really. I mean, the survival of businesses, and I want Ken to jump on this one. Supermarkets, we already seen supermarkets complying with this uh, directive by the government. Of course, a lot more are going to comply in the, in, in the long run. Ken, how do you assess, uh, you know, service providers' a, a com a compl a compliance, rather, uh, to this directive? Well, it's going to be a nightmare. It's impossible to be able to uh, supervise such an industrial scale of uh, compliance among mm. service providers. Um, I think uh, what the government is hoping to do is uh, to be able to achieve uh, that uh, fear value of people won't be able to access, so there'll be a rush of people to get uh, vaccinations in the last minute. I think that's the hope that so that people can participate. Uh, it, 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 it is an unusual approach to uh, doing, uh, achieving such a thing, particularly when businesses are also trying to recover, mm. when businesses have lost almost two years worth of businesses. So uh, one can only hope that uh, a, a, a better mechanism um, can be found in which uh, businesses can continue operating as people get vaccinated. Wohoro, well, I'd like you to jump on this next one. The UAE, particularly Dubai, uh, suspended Kenyan flights for 48 hours earlier on in the week. That uh, directive was extended up till now. And considering the kind of business that Kenya conducts with the UAE, of course, there are a lot of people who have been affected. You, can, you can't now travel for business uh, deals. And of course, now there's more of teleconferencing going on. What do you make of that move, Ohoro? Considering there's been quite uh, some statistics, 29.6% level of infection rate. I think that's a record high that we hit this week. 
I, I just fear that uh, our greatest emergency is not medical. It's really the economic impact of these sort of uh, so-called uh, medical uh, responses to us. And one has to wonder, there's almost a sense of a controlled demolition of business everywhere. Because you imagine even for Kenya, if you ban people from the supermarkets and the formal businesses, what you're basically doing is pushing everyone into the informal sector. Because mm. even the ones who are vaccinated are going to feel the effect of the unvaccinated. And that's about more than 50% of the population. Basically, 50% withdraw from the formal industry. There's going to be a boom in the informal industry. In fact, the only other place I can see a boom would be uh, the Jumia. If I was to buy shares, I'd be buying Jumia shares right now because of digital uh, digital uh, deliveries, um, dig, 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 online shopping. Mm. And so for what Dubai is doing, it's, uh, I think, it's a much bigger de uh, de uh, dynamic internationally. It looks like the EU. There's a massive, powerful force behind this push for everyone to get vaccinated and, in a sense, uh, pub, um, punishing countries that uh, seem to be slow in doing that. So it's, uh, let's wait and see because uh, I suspect there's going to be a lot of upheaval in the near future. Ken, I'd also like to get your thoughts on this one, even as we try to bring back William. UAE's ban that has been extended on Kenya, particularly because of the surge in the COVID-19 numbers. What do you make of it, Ken? Uh, well, I think it was quite of a surprise in the sense that uh, this is a particularly busy period uh, for, those, uh, for that particular route. Um, I think the full details are yet to come out, uh, but obviously the disruptive nature of it uh, will have both short-term and long-term consequences. Um, obviously, the overriding factor is there's a global or micron variant that uh, is, uh, is, is spreading across the world, albeit uh, we have been told it's a milder variant than the Delta variant, uh, but still it seems to be causing concern. So I think it's how do countries be able to, uh, how are they able to reach at a mutual agreement mm. on how international travel can be conducted, particularly during such a busy time. Very well. Wohoro, back to you again. So this is a blank check. The year is ending. Uh, which stories stood out for you in the economic front this year? Uh, maybe far and away has been the fact that uh, we got to a point, of course, given my background, we got to a point where even my colleagues in Treasury said they had a, a major issue with our debt position. Mm. And I think the linking, uh, uh, threading the link between our debt levels and our economic performance in the middle of what ought to be the most classic example of an exogenous event called COVID. You know, we know like economic models, we always talk about <laughs> almost like we call it the, um, <laughs> the adjustment factor regarding um, the exogenous factors that can affect your model. And in the last two years, we've experienced the, ma the mother of all exogenous factors and how that alone has tipped not just Kenya, but a majority of very big, including the West, a lot of countries in the West. Mm. over the edge in terms of their debt and their obligations. And you can, you, can see, you can see the rolling effects of that in terms of even co competitiveness, in terms of stability of nations. And now even for us with the fact that about two years of, of this thing, the informal sector is really the only saving, saving grace of our economy. And that to me is by far the, the biggest story. That when you bring that debt together and the exogenous factor in the midst of a, of a, a threatening economic uh, uh, climate both international and local there's nothing that compares with that and uh, I, hope, I hope to see some really big uh, um, imaginative ways of you know uh, countering that because you can't go on like this it's just it's going to kill us all i think ah great i'm going to give you a chance i'm going to give each and every one of you a chance to tell us uh, uh, just a media fraternity what economic stories you want to see covered next year ken i'm going to give you a chance also right now to just give me your honest reviews so which economic stories stood out for you ken this year i think the weekend of uh, easter sunday when uh, kenyans bombarded the imf website and uh, really uh, uh, attacked the that incident and really really asked for the imf to be able to reconsider its debt policies to uh, Africa. I thought that was quite eye-opening because when you talk about debt, mm. it tends to be in high-level circles of economists and public policy. But, but when you're ordinary Joe the plumber, when you're ordinary Mamamboga, 
goes to the IMF website. For me, I thought that was uh, pretty fast. It shows how the issue of debt has seeped into the national psyche mm. and has to be addressed in a significant way. Amazing. Still staying with the issues of the state, we have seen quite uh, a renewed energy, a renewed reforms going into some state parastatals, talking about Kenya Power, we saw the state take over there, and uh, we saw some issues about former CEOs, former MDs going to be, you know, investigated with regard to some of the issues that have been happening, you know, in, in those state parastatals. Gishinga, what do you make of that move? Do you see any good end towards it? I'm sorry, please ask again. Gishinga, I'm asking, with the, the renewed move towards reforming the state parastatals, is it in goodwill? Do you see an end to it? I'm sorry, there's quite a bit of feedback here. I can't, I'm unable to get to you, Brian George. All right, my apologies. We want to try and fix that. But I'm going to let Ohoro comment on that too. Ohoro, we've seen a renewed, uh, you know, energy sort of, in pursuing some of uh, the reforms intended and targeted towards the state uh, parastatals, mm. key among them Kenya Power, um, up to mm. the extent that it was being said that some of these MDs and some of the CEOs are going to be hunted, particularly just to try and find a chronology of how some of these state parastatals got to the place that they are right now with regard to accountability, uh, mismanagement of funds, and of course service delivery to the public. What do you make of that move? Uh, I would say maybe the, it will have been much better for this to have been in the first 100 years of a new administration than towards the end of, of an administration. And mm. to that extent, I suppose uh, one of the things you'll notice is that we have had very few incidences of a successful prosecution of, uh, of these uh, heads of uh, parastatals. And so my, my jury, the jury is still out. I mean, the, the talk is there. The move to, towards doing something about it is there. But I always say, you know, until we begin to see the, the rate of success, the success strike rate of convictions of uh, well, on Ibo Malia Uma, mm. until we start seeing that happening and you can see a successful jailing of uh, individuals, it's really early to tell. I mean, it's a good move, but uh, I think as a country, we also jaded a bit by the fact that these things don't normally lead to any you know, long-term convictions. Gishinga, if you are back, let's talk about inflation and particularly the fuel prices. I mean, this has been an issue the whole year. Talk to us about what you think should be done to stabilize the fuel prices, considering that the fuel levy had, um, the fuel levy had also been put in place. Gishinga, if you're there. All right, Wohoro, I'm going to let you go on on this one too. The fuel prices, particularly with regard to inflation and of course the reviews that have been happening the whole year. Talk to us about how do we stabilize those fuel prices? Uh, almost inevitably you have to do with, uh, one is uh, um, liberalizing the, the, the market in terms of how fuel is bought in this country. Mm. It is still very much under the preview of very few, a very few entitled elite uh, group. There's also, of course, the, the nexus between uh, uh, the way our economy works in terms of who participates in, the, in that large end, large end of, the, of the economy. And so even when we made the big moves to, reduce our, to begin to reduce our, 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 our energy costs, we've still found out that it's been much harder to undo what we call cartel uh, arrangements because they're always locked into very strong uh, contracts. And so to me, again, it's a very structural thing. And by now, we'd have expected to have seen a, a significant change in, in, the, in the fuel price. We have not seen any, even in terms, of, even without, our, even with a promise that that would be addressed very quickly. So, as far as the inflation is concerned, in a falling economy, the impact is even greater. And to mm. me, the concern is that it's, it's, it's an emergency here and now, especially given the lockdown of uh, a lot of businesses, given the COVID uh, uh, scenario right now. Great. Still staying with you, it would be injustice to the government if I do not mention particularly the diplomatic relations that President Uhuru Kenyatta has been keen on, um, you know, restoring and of course championing, particularly with regard to the foreign policy, to the extent that we saw a sitting president address a bicameral parliament. We have seen the president come out strongly on the ICJ ruling of uh, between Kenya and Somalia and saying no inch more, no inch less. Talk to us about even the issue of DRC now, DRC's prospects in joining the East Africa community. What does this mean to the country, uh, Wohoro? 
Uh, to be brilliant, in fact, there's one thing I'd say that uh, our president has absolutely uh, knocked the ball out of our park has been his uh, mm. foreign, his diplomatic skills in terms of uh, either enlisting the help of others, mobilizing Africa to work as one, and seeking new opportunities for the continent. And in that sense, it's been, uh, an absolute amazing uh, uh, spectrum to, to observe. The uh, fact that, for example, the Equity Bank has moved into, we, have actually, we actually have Kenyan multinationals moving out of Kenya to help other parts of Africa. To me, that's the original dream of, of Pan-Africanism, where we ourselves, Najita Gemea, we go out and do and help others. The other one uh, that's uh, a, good, uh, a good example is uh, Kenjan and what it's doing in Djibouti, what it's doing in Ethiopia. Absolutely. Again, those are the sort of examples that give me an opportunity to, to celebrate, I think, our foreign mm. uh, ventures in, in, this, in this time and space. Amazing. I love, I love how you put it particularly because uh, there's a report that came out a couple of weeks ago. It was saying intra-Africa trade is at a whooping, oh, sorry, uh, a sorry 1.5%. I mean, the intra-Africa trade that we do within Africa is at 1.5% compared to what we export to other countries. So that those balances of trade are really, really worrying, particularly with regard to how we keep getting travel bans, we keep getting uh, mm. our goods sometimes banned from going to other countries. I mean, it would be a good thing. And what would be the role of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement in inspiring intra-Africa trade in your own view, Wahoro? Oh, absolutely everything. And honestly, my only precaution, my cautionary tale for Africa is this. Unless we can learn to depend on ourselves first, and everything that we are doing, and work against the forces, international and other places where I work very hard against us be developing our own manufacturing base. That is to me the one economic priority number one for African leaders, because we have everything we need. You know, if, if you, if the highest of the world boycotted Africa mm -hmm. and would uh, mobilize our own genius to, for manufacturing, what you would need the rest of the world? That's the absolute truth. And to that extent, you know, it's the biggest opportunity that's been left. The lowest hanging fruit in Africa has been that its opportunity and its resources are not used by the locals. And if we can overcome that, I think Africa is ready for, 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 for takeoff. All right, we understand William and Ken are back with us right now. William, I was just asking the panelists, what stories stood out for you this year in the economic front, William? William, if you're there. All right. All right. Ken, so you are heavy on foreign diplomacy and issues to do with diplomatic relations. You mentioned that in our previous uh, chats right here on Biz Chat Weekly. I'd like you to comment briefly on President Uhuru Kenyatta's diplomatic uh, relations moves really to restore impaired, sort of impaired diplomatic relations to the extent that we saw President Samia Sulu has an address by camera parliament here in Nairobi. What do you, what do you make of that, Ken? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Brian George. I think one of the areas that the president has done very well mm. has been on foreign policy. Ability to bring us closer to our neighbors uh, with that visit by President Suluhu, uh, but even with distant partners such as the United States and China, and, and obviously the efforts to bring uh, the DRC market closer to Kenya. So I think uh, what we're developing as Kenya is not only a, a good foreign policy, but also something in the technical field that is called a soft power. And soft power is the ability to carry that attractive pool that can bring in investors, that can bring in uh, people of like-minded. And I think that's an area we've done very well. Perhaps moving forward has to be how do we convert these foreign ties into economic ties? How do we start converting some of our embassies and uh, our ambassadors abroad mm. to also become uh, trade uh, ambassadors, people who can bring businesses from particularly areas that are non-traditional uh, in nature to Kenya? Amazing. And I understand the Kenya Export and Promotion uh, promotion and Branding Agency is targeting at least 22 new virgin markets across the world to go and sell our products there. I want to give each and every one of you an opportunity to, to give us a final remark. And my question is, which stories did the media do justice to this year? Wahora, I'm going to let you go fast on this one. Under 30 seconds, please. Oh, can I be the last? I'm still thinking. Uh, okay, so, so uh, Ken, are you ready to go for that one? Your last comments on which stories we did justice to this year? 
I think there are plenty of stories. I think you guys have covered the debt situation very well. Okay. I think uh, the media has also covered the issue of um, uh, the economic models that are being proposed mm. uh, particularly well, and there will be big talking points next year. Great, and um, which is exactly my next question, uh, Gishinga, really. I mean, which stories do you want to see covered next year, particularly with regard to uh, the economic front? Well, it's uh, going to be an election year, and mm. what we've said for many times on this show is that the econ economy will be at the center of that political debate. Mm. And of course, a number of economic models have been put in place. Mm. Some are still under development. So I think Kenyans will need to have time to interrogate each of the economic models and see which one can carry the day. And we do hope the one that is more pro-private sector, because what we've had in Kenya is a very government-driven growth. What we now need in this country is a more private sector-driven growth. So whichever economic model that speaks to that, I hope it can come out and excite Kenyans. Amazing. Wahoro, this is your chance again, a blank check, to tell us which stories did we do justice to and what do you want to see covered next year, uh, particularly with regard to the business environment? I think I really like the fact that you've uh, spoken to Anjiko a lot more okay. this year across the spectrum, and it's something I'd like to see more. Mm. It's not enough for us as, as economists to be pontificating up in ivory towers, but you, if you go and ask Kwanjiko on the ground, mm. she'll tell exactly what's working. And I think one of the, uh, I mean, like my colleague mentions about that, the fact that you'd ask uh, the common one and you get to see how it impacts uh, that level would be absolutely, uh, I think it's the way to go. In an election year, I would also like to just propose that uh, we, we, we interrogate, we have a, probably the first election where economic policy will take center stage. So I'd really like to see, uh, you know, our leaders, our potential leaders, brought to to, to task uh, at, the, at the table to really defend their economic uh, master plans for, for our future and to make concrete plans and to make mm. concrete promises publicly. So they said they are going to do it. You can hold them to that and you can record it that they've added, undertaken to do X, Y, or Z for us so that you know we can remind them mm. of keeping promise keeping is a big thing, you know, especially in our continent. We need to make it even bigger. Amazing. Many thanks, my panelists, for the whole year's reviews on the biggest stories that have been making headlines in the 52 weeks that we've had in 2021. And we can treat that as the last address. And many thanks to you, the viewer, for always being here with us on Business Today every other time, 3 p.m. East African time. Biz Chat Weekly takes a rest. We'll be back next year. Many thanks once again for your invaluable company. I am Brian Giorgiotieno. This again forms my last live, uh, live appearance on TV this year. We'll be back next year. See you soon. Mungu niwe tisote, tena natupenda sote, natuna win forever. <laughs>